Good afternoon and greetings to everyone that is joining us for our eighth episode of Teacher Talks, sponsored by the Falcon Feathers. Falcon Feathers is an organization for art education majors at Seattle Pacific University, where I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Music Education and Orchestral Activities. Feathers stands for Future Educators in the Arts, Transforming and Human Experience and Realities. It's a fantastic acronym. And I'm happy to do this series for those of you that might be watching for the first time to just help connect educators and students in this really unique time that we're facing through this uh, global pandemic. Um, we're not meeting face to face and normal conversations that might happen in a hallway or in a classroom have been diminished. And so this is a way to utilize the resources that we have. We are truly blessed to have technology to allow us to connect with each other as we practice social distancing and appropriately distance ourselves physically we have to protect ourselves not to be distanced intellectually or spiritually and stay connected. So uh, it's been an honor to be able to facilitate these conversations with all types of people. And I encourage those of you that are watching to please make suggestions. This is meant to be interactive. We're running this through Facebook Live, even though the platform that you see is a Zoom session. I will be talking to uh, today, Dr. Randall Alsup, which is an honor to have him and be speaking with him today. But this conversation is not just between the two of us. So as you have comments or questions, please post them. I have a second screen that you see me staring at that I'll be sort of monitoring and bringing questions into the conversation. And we'll have a, a launching off point that we'll introduce here in just a second. But again, thank you for being a part of this. And I will put this conversation up on YouTube so that you will be able to see it. If you don't uh, participate in the live session, we'll have this documented so you can come back and look at it. And then always feel free to reach out, make suggestions for other people you want us to have talks with or questions that you might have that could guide us to, to new people to speak with. So thank you again and again for sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. Um, Seattle Pacific University is a private liberal arts college with a Christian identity. And so a part of this conversation I like to a facilitate is just starting with a moment of prayer. Whatever prayer means to you, however you like to participate in that, if you bow your head and close your eyes, if you want to echo the sentiment that I'm sharing, whatever that might look like for you, I just take this brief moment for us to begin with a moment of reflection. Dear Lord, thank you for this time and the resources that you provide us with. We are so truly blessed to have unique friendships and colleagues all over the world in music and education and the arts and technology gives us the opportunity to connect with them in unique ways. I pray that the words that we exchange today go to your divine glory and purpose and that the people that are listening are blessed by this conversation and find new ways of thinking about music and education in this brand new time that you are giving us. God, we know that you would never give us anything that we cannot handle without your provision and care. And so I seek that we are drawn closer to you and that we are pushed through this and find new opportunities, new openings, and new possibilities for music and education for our students and for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, uh, Dr. Alsop, first and foremost, it sincerely is an honor to be talking to you. Um, I, I wanted to reach out to you because I got your book this past summer, for those of you that have not seen this, Remixing the Classroom, um, Toward an Open Philosophy of Music Education. This is something I'm really passionate about, about reimagining what music and education look like. And I read this book this summer, was sincerely inspired, and then got to meet you in Canada at the International Society for Music Education Conference and uh, picked your brain briefly and thought, man, I would love to be able to talk to you about this one day, not knowing what was going to happen. And uh, so we started these teacher talks and I thought this might be a great opportunity to do this. And I hope that this can serve as a launching off point because the, the first chapter to me is, or really the first part of the book, is so apropos to what we're going through. And so this will be a launching off point, but for, for students and people that are listening, um, hello to Julia and Latanya, it's great to see you guys watching. Uh, they might not know about where you are right now at Columbia and, and what you're serving. So if you'll just give us a little background of kind of who you are so that people can better understand um, your position right now that you're serving in. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you first, uh, Chris. It's just uh, such a great honor to uh, be, be doing this. Um, of course, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous. <laughs> um, uh, at Columbia, I think I'm in my 17th year or 18th year. Wow. And uh, I did 
my graduate work there. I left for a while and went to Hartwood College upstate, came back. Um, and so I've been there forever. Uh, and this year I made full professor, which was great. Oh, congratulations. Uh, wow. Yeah. And so I do, uh, I have a couple signature classes, a two part creativity class where we um, bring all the sort of new students, whether they're new doctoral students or new master students um, together. And we, we practice this idea of open student centered learning. Yeah. Uh, we, in the first semester, we think about how we design instruction uh, mm -hmm. for open learning. So I, I, I contend early in the semester that teaching, um, in a student-centered, creative, open-ended way is the hardest way to teach. Yes. And it is also the, the kind of teaching that requires the most amount of structure. So here's another antinomy. So I talk about antinomies in my second chapter, which is the coexistence of two contradictions. Mm -hmm. So education is a classic antinomy because it is the coexistence of the change that's coming in the future and preparing students for a world that they can't predict and we couldn't be that's couldn't we could not be supplied with more evidence for that <laughs> right now as well as the continuity that we inherit as we are inserted into traditions and communities and cultures yeah. so without both of those two things contradicting uh, education wouldn't have the meaning it has so in this open classroom in the first semester, we explore the contradiction of um, a highly structured classroom, yeah. uh, designing a highly structured classroom such that it produces uh, unpredictable openings. And nice. it is crazy hard to both model that, it's hard to, uh, so I model it, the students experience it, then we pull back and we analyze uh, what we're doing and then they have to practice teaching that you know so it's 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 a very um, it's a very uh, crazy hard difficult fun wild <laughs> class that I love the second half of the class is uh, what used to be kind of my garage band class and that was where um, we put kids together in small groups, kids, um, adults together <laughs> in small groups to compose collaboratively across differences such that we experiment with what a, what a democratic classroom might look like. Whereas such that, you know, difference is not something we erase or do away with. Difference is what we leverage. Nice. Um, and that class, interestingly, uh, at least for me, is changed away from the sort of early garage band songwriting model to more of a musical theater class. So hmm. students were naturally putting together these songs that we were writing into theater form, and I just followed them. And so now the class is, we're, we're making musical theater. Uh, and, and this is again, another one of these contradictions of an open classroom, which is, I'm not a singer. I've never been a musical theater director. And here I am facilitating this kind of classroom because a particular pedagogy is put into place that doesn't require sort of author authoritarian expertise mm -hmm. uh, or command leadership. You know, I'm, I'm depending on people and structuring the classroom such that we can operate as co-teachers and co-learners. So I don't have to be an expert in, in the actual the teaching of a musical theater class. So that those two classes, I, I um, they are probably the most meaningful things I do in my life. Wow. And then I have a, 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 a sort of standard philosophy class where we read and discuss. Um, and that's that's not so wildly un, unimaginable. <laughs> well, it's uh, I mean, you've number first and foremost i mean thank you for the work that you're doing because i think it's significant not only in light of everything that we're being challenged by in education right now with schools being closed and trying to reimagine what our classrooms are supposed to look like solely through technology not just benefiting from technology but you hit i mean you hit on so many significant things 
that I personally believe it's really important for educators to be thinking about, not just art educators. Um, and one of them that I find interesting is trying to trying to be imaginative and creative in your pedagogy when you're still operating within this structure of public education. Um, it reminded me, I turned around and grabbed it. I'm sure you know, uh, Patty Lather has such incredible research out uh, and her whole, I mean, all of her work with feminist theory and queer theory, and it's just amazing. But Getting Lost was a book that I immediately thought of because she, she introduced this idea of doubled science to research. And uh, I've been playing with that idea in some of my own research in that. And I'm going to, I mean, forgive me, Dr. Lather, because I'm going to try to say this, you know, in 10 seconds, the amazing work she's done with doubled science. But this idea that as you're trying to do research and reimagine something and challenge something while you also have to operate within it, that, that is a unique type of research and a unique way of thinking and being. And I've always felt challenged that way as an educator because I was, I find myself fortunate that I was able to teach full time and go to graduate school. And while I'm in these classes in graduate school, you know, philosophizing and theorizing and thinking about how education could be reimagined and what I could do, I'm then walking right back into the system and teaching and being held accountable and trying to operate within that system and yet still challenge it. And it was this incredible interplay between what accountability means for art educators. I was teaching in the state of Texas and so what that means in Texas and how I have to function and operate but as I'm functioning and operating, I'm supporting the system that I want to challenge. And you know, if I immediately challenge it, then there's issues of equity and accountability and the administration you know, raises questions of what my teaching is like. And it's difficult to find those places in practice and say, I'm gonna do something new when it challenges a system that you're required. I mean, that you're held accountable to in some states by law to do A, B, C, and D. And this is what the outcomes have to look like. And, and then you're fighting. The other thing I think you tapped on is the culture that we're battling. That there is arguably, because we have built systems of success, and I, I say that intentionally, we've inherited things. It bothers me when I talk to colleagues that say, well, success in my orchestra classroom, success in my elementary school classroom looks like this. This is what success is. I say, well, you know that we created that success. At some point, someone defined that as successful. And if we created it, if we're the authors of it, we can then edit it. And so fighting that culture of a very authoritarian, you know, very structured, I'm the sage on the stage, I'm the conductor, I choose the repertoire, I make the decisions, I'm the facilitator, I'm teaching. So many programs, music programs in general, but art programs, it could be theater, it could be dance, it could be visual arts. The educator, educator assumes that control and is also assuming and inheriting definitions of success. And so we, we continue to say, well, that's a successful program, but there are other opportunities. There are other ways of thinking about that classroom, but it's just getting, again, it's just getting reinforced. It just builds off of these things that we've inherited. Um, going in, in back in, kind of into the book, but just wherever this conversation is leading, what are some of your thoughts about that, of the struggle of being in the classroom, of teaching in the classroom, and not necessarily have the freedom that I think graduate programs or college in general sort of offers us to think, but being in the trenches, as it were. Yeah. I, I think you went straight to the um, very problem um, of anybody who is um, trying to reimagine practice. You, mm. you go straight to the heart of it because we have a choice. We either teach for accommodation we figure out what is out there and we help our students, we help our, insert our students successfully into what already is. Um, and the students want that and I don't blame them for that. Yeah. I, I think nobody wants to go to a graduate school that prepares them for failure in, <laughs> in the, you know, when they go back into uh, the structures, um, that you're talking about. So then, what is so then what is uh, the job of the teacher at university teacher educator? It's to play with um, these tensions, right? There's just no other way around it, and you can't be so radical that you um, that you that it's some kind of malpractice in the sense of hmm. um, have no tools for 
uh, reinsertion. But absolutely, you cannot simply you cannot simply um, describe, look around, assess what is, and then uh, accommodate teachers into that that pre-existing uh, paradigm because. Um, as you said, it's 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 full of problems, and and that that could be the the, the segue to the next discussion because um, I don't want to take part in a system that has racial inequities, yeah. that has um, uh, stru structural uh, uh, inequities. Uh, I don't I don't want to participate. I don't want to help students accommodate into you know the Westchester School District that has a gazillion dollars. And then 20 miles south is struggling for instruments. Um, so we have to really suffer this thing that you're talking about. And um, I'm going to throw it back at you and just start thinking a little bit. Yeah. But I, I don't know if, if you're asking for anything specific. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's something that even in this conversation, as, as I've shared with you, and I think anyone that has tolerated talking to me for more than five minutes knows, I love Maxine Green, um, and this reminds me, I'm, I'm working, I told you this yesterday, uh, I'm working with a student in independent study right now, and we're reading uh, Releasing the Imagination, and I immediately thought of, in, in that book, she, she writes this great prose called Teaching for Openings, and very humbly, and I think this is something that we all struggle with, she admits, you know, I'm challenged by teaching the structures that exist, right? Teaching this culture that exists because it's what we have right now and benefiting from those structures and trying to find ways to challenge it without ultimately defeating myself. And of course I'm paraphrasing, but I thought it was, it was such a humble gesture um, for such, you know, a, a magnificent scholar as Maxine Green to say, yeah, I mean, I think we need to rethink higher ed and I think we need to rethink education, but I would be foolish to deny that I've benefited from the structures that are in place and I've learned this system and I've maximized, you know, my resources in it. And I know for me, I mean, talking about systems of inequity and trying to reimagine the classroom, that's something I always struggled with. I was, I was born and raised in Texas. I, I feel confident in saying I understand the structures and politics and culture of music education in the state of Texas, having been brought up in it. And then when I got in the classroom, I found myself, particularly in my first three years of teaching, you know, doing what was done to me, as it were, right? Like, this is what I learned to be successful. This is what I was taught in my undergraduate preparation. And so this is what I'm going to do. And thinking of anything else is, was arguably like heresy. Like, you just, you didn't think outside the box. This is what I, I lived through. And that was what was interesting to me is I wasn't just doing what I was taught. It wasn't just my teacher preparation program. I grew up K through 12 in the state and the, the system had not changed. I mean, in all those years that it was, it was driven although in a large part by competition and it was about um, comparative measures of success. And there's so much research that can tell us there's benefits from that. It's not to negate that that exists and that people find success in it. But as I tried to find ways that I could, you know, loosen the hold of that competition had on my curriculum or loosen the hold that, you know, competition had on my students and the way I was thinking about my teaching, not even the way I was teaching, but the way I thought about teaching, I tried to find that. And I, I struggled in the fact that, well, I benefit from these competitions. That's how I'm getting funding. That's how I'm getting recognition. That's how I am being defined as successful by my administrators. And so where, where do I suddenly stop participating and perpetuating these ideas and shift focus? And as I tried that, and I'm, I'm trying to humble myself in saying this, as I tried that, I definitely got a lot of backlash. I, I distinctly remember going to a colleague once, and I'll try to keep anonymity as much as possible, but a lot of my friends that, uh, for all these people, Rui Stevens and Kay Van Landingham, it's good to see you, Don Sheridan, um, fellow educators in the state of Texas, uh, UIL is a very intense monster, the University of Scholastic League, this statewide competition um, that teachers live with and live through, and it has incredible benefits pedagogically, but it also challenges a lot of people in how they're supposed to teach and engage with their students because it's competition. 
right? It's this it's competitive nature of how we perform and how we're adjudicated. And I kept thinking, how, how do I find a way to challenge that, but still honor the expectations that people have for me to participate in this contest and do well? And as I pushed against that, I went to a colleague once and I said, you know, I know, I know the state laws now, I've, I've really dived into them, I know the state standards, I know what's expected of me, like what I'm held accountable to, and what if I just didn't go to this contest this year? What if we just didn't do it? I'm spending, at that point I was spending about, this is not an exaggeration, I, I, I would take three different orchestras to this contest, and between the cost of the buses, meals, the registration fees, and buying the music that we needed for copyright purposes, we had scores for all the judges and stuff, I was spending over $2,000 a year on just facilitating this experience, this one experience, which to me was a part of our year, but it wasn't the purpose of our year. And I went and I said, what if I just didn't go? And word for word, my colleague says, well, you can't do that. I said, well, why? There's no, I mean, there's, there's nothing that says I'm required, but you have to go. I was like, why? Because like, that's just what we do. And so I was brave enough to bring it up to my principal and I said, I'm thinking about just not going to this contest this year. You would have thought that I threw blood on her or something. I mean, it was just this like high crime to even suggest that you wouldn't participate in this cultural aspect of teaching. It was, it was so intense and I thought, but why? There's, there's no laws, there's no standards, there's nothing that says I do this. This is a cultural thing that's been adopted, that this is a part of our teaching. She says, well, you have to do it. But why? So, well, because I said so. Like, that's what it boiled down to. So, I mean, that brings in politics and power and all of that in terms of how much agency does a teacher really have in the systems that we're operating in. But it's, I mean, without making this too tangential, to me, it's at the heart of what you're talking about, of like, we're inheriting and living these experiences as educators and so many of us that are music educators grew up in a system of you know public education or were inspired to go into the field because we had those experiences in grade school and so how how do you start navigating that because from my own experience and i to be fair i put my foot in my mouth all the time so i don't think that i was as tactful as i could have been talking about it i was probably pretty abrasive at the whole idea um but you know, how do you start to navigate that to say, well, I do want to challenge it a little bit, and you know, I don't know. I mean, do you have, do you have any insights or advice or I mean, what are your experiences with it? I think um, I, I've heard variations on this story my, my entire life, and mm -hmm. I think I've always sat there and sort of in a frozen state <laughs> because I'm full of empathy and and really listening to you and thinking that the kids probably aren't complaining, the parents like it, the principal wants to do it, yeah. it's working. So why rock the boat, right? But you know, educationally, you're the, you're the person who has to make a case against this uh, brick wall that um, there's something else over here yeah. I want to show yeah. you. So, the, so I finally heard somebody answer this question beautifully. <laughs> and it was Sandy Stauffer at uh, Arizona State. And <laughs> she came up with the best response because there's always when we bring in conversations about equity or equality and we're talking about this and that, social justice, somebody always comes up and says, How, you know, what does it look like in a large ensemble? It doesn't work in this, it doesn't work. And she says, call it a pilot study. Choose one small thing you want to change hmm. and get all the stakeholders together and explain to them what a, what a pilot study is. It's a chance to, to uh, practice something with low stakes and that you're going to expect to make mistakes and you're going to learn from these mistakes and that mistakes are built in to the pilot study. Yeah. So you might say, according to, I'm, I'm channeling Sandy Stoffer right now, uh, you might say, listen, instead of, going to this uh, festival in April, April is going to be composing month. And I don't know what it's going to look like. And you lay the groundwork such that uh, you talk to parents, band boosters, you, you, get, you get some kind of, some kind of, uh, you make your case, right? So this is kind of democratic, right? You can yeah. make your case. And 
insofar as you can find a number of people to sign on to this pilot study, you just build into the fact that it's going to fail. <laughs> and therefore, uh, when it gets messy and uh, you collect the stakeholders at the end of the project and say, how are we going to do this differently next year? Yeah. Then you're already taking a small brick from that wall and you're replacing it with, I don't know, straw, mud, something else. Yeah. So, you know, and I, and I think the thing that people, and I, listen, I get scared listening to your story too, because I, I can't imagine what an early career teacher would do in this setting, you know? Uh, but I think that we have more power than we think we do. And I think um, small change um, in, 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 a, in a system like you are in um, would be the way I would go. I, I think in many ways, like in a system that doesn't work, like on the East Coast where, you know, teachers don't even have instruments. Yeah. Well then, you know, you can, you can do anything. You, hmm. you can make instruments. You, you're, you're, uh, you can compose on your phone for a while. You know, um, we have a, I have a student who had his kids um, writing 20-second hand-washing songs, <laughs> you know? Nice. And so, yeah, so, but I don't know that if you're in this really tight, closed system that you're talking about, how do you find space to write a 20-second, you know, a hand-washing song or whatever the equi equivalent is? Yeah. Um, but there is. I think there is. Um, it's crazy so, to me, though, because... Uh, and sandy stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's incredible advice. But it's it's interesting to hear you talk about that, especially in comparison to some things that are happening in the East Coast, because I think I'm personally frustrated by the sort of uh, the conversations that come about, especially at conferences, where I'll meet someone and, you know, California, Florida, and Texas have, you know, these really strong art education programs, uh, well-funded, they're large states, large populations, lots of tax dollars to put into things. And so you see that, but they're all very competitive, built on sort of competitive models, um, which to clarify, it, there are benefits to that. So it's not that you get rid of it, but for that to be the focus of what you're doing in your classroom, I think that's something that should be challenged. But when you look at that, I always struggle, I'm, I'm going back to that phrase success, of what success is because it it frustrated me that I would say to someone like, oh yeah, you know, I was teaching in Texas and they're like, oh, Texas. And they're like, wow, you know, music ed in Texas is like, yeah, music education in Texas is phenomenal. It's wonderful. There are incredible things that are happening, things happening that aren't happening in any other state, just like there are things happening in California, so on and so forth. But what scares me is when that becomes a goal, when that becomes, well, I want my state or my classroom to look like this other, and we're not contextualizing it, and we're not looking at what our community needs are and what our st student needs are and where we are, that it, it creates that stultification, you know, that it suddenly, it stalls out and creates this fictitious barrier of, well, I'll only ever be as good as this, as this thing that I'm trying to emulate, rather than I'm gonna create, I'm actually gonna build a program that's unique to where I am and what I'm doing, and I can be inspired by other things that are happening but I'm not going to make that the goal, especially without taking into consideration all of the other, you know, socio-political factors that go into your, I mean, I think it's fair enough to say you are not going to have a program that looks like what's happening in Plano, Texas in central New York. It's just not gonna happen. They're two totally different communities, two totally different beasts. So to have an educator that might be transplanted from one state to another, like I am, I'm now in the state of Washington, um, I brought a ton of baggage with me that I didn't anticipate, that I walk into the school and I go, well, this is what it looked like in Texas, and why doesn't it look like that here? And it took me too long, in my opinion, to go, well, of course it's not gonna look the same. I'm in a different state. This is a different community. It's an entirely different culture. What I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you remind me that one of the things about these constructed notions of excellence, um, you know, as defined by concert ratings and competition, is that in the process of these achievements, um, the music we make makes and remakes us. So we become mm -hmm. very particular kind of um, musicians as a result. And 
I'm thinking of the ways in which um, it, it's kind of um, uh, Alfie Cohn um, punished by rewards. So once you figure out how to get the gold star, you lose any interest in anything except getting more and more and more and more gold stars. Yes. And, and, to, and so as a learner, as an artist, you become a teacher pleaser um, and a audition pleaser. Um, and that's, I think, the real, the real tragedy. So when, when success is defined according to what I think is the most important criteria, which is growth, uh, and then, then we have to figure out, well, what is growth? Um, what is growth for me, I think, is both um, depth and breadth. Right, so we want somebody to be on maybe one instrument for a very long time. We want somebody to know a particular style very well, but we also want them to explore, explore broadly across differences and to find things and, and come into contact with with um, questions they didn't even know they had to ask. Yeah. So the tragedy of being a 19-year-old with a whole suitcase full of gold stars is. You're not curious anymore about anything except wow. um, how how to how to get more of these. Wow, that's huge. And I I was that student. I was absolutely one hundred percent the the definition of little fish in a big pond. Um, and I went to Northwestern and um, tied for last place in freshman auditions. I had never in my life experienced. Um, not winning. So my mm. identity was um, completely, I mean, and by the way, all freshmen should tie for last place. But I, I didn't have, I didn't have, no, I didn't, I, I was unprepared for um, the ways in which my self-regard um, was never I, it, it wasn't an identity I considered. It, it was something I adopted hmm. because I was being made and remade through a particular kind of competition-based uh, music experience. Um, and one of the things I do immediately, I think, in my classes uh, at, at TC is uh, break that teacher-pleasing thing immediately Yeah. Uh, in, insofar as it's possible. Uh, because, um, I mean, what I, I don't want to see an art exhibit or I don't want to hear music that is based on an artist who's good at pleasing um, the establishment. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I want to, I, I, that's not how I uh, think about art um, as an exercise. In, it, art is not the exercise of pleasing the established ways of doing things. Um, it's the search for both. <laughs> it's the both and search. Yeah. It's the, the understanding that you, that you are in a field that has norms and structures, but that there's always room to explore. And, and if we want to talk about open and closed, um, the closed environment is never one that's fixed. It's just a, a space in which it's a, it's a bounded space in which um, norms precede your encounter, standards precede your encounter, and that an open space is not getting rid of um, it's not getting rid of norms. It's only to say that um, some um, norms are important and uh, they're they're good to learn, but others will be made by my community, which is different than your community. Hmm. And that's the beginning of opening up. Um, that's the beginning of opening up even the cl most closed form. You know, uh, uh, a black woman who wants to sing uh, uh, Schubert's Winterreise and wants to say, I want a problem, I want to make problematic this idea of whiteness. But yet I'm going to sing Winterreise as a woman um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the best, uh, in the, in, in the, according to what I know is the rules for singing Schubert in German, but yet I am going to bring a critical lens to this 
through maybe multimedia, through something yeah. else. So that she's beginning to break something open and say, um, I'm not getting rid of norms, um, the norms that preceded me. I'm just going to both work with them and chip away at them where I, where I, where I see I can bring something different or new to this experience. I want to forgive me because I don't want to embarrass you completely, but I love this because it took me right back to something that you wrote um, in your book. Uh, so you said, music education, we argue, should be human specific, not practice specific. The practice of music education should be mindful of the present tense and aimed at transforming human culture rather than the mere replicating of practices worked out by the lucky innovators of another age. This is a vision that would collapse the either or binaries that direct most of today's practices. And then you have this, this long quote that I love. The purpose of music education should be to renew the musical culture from which it comes, to remake a new generation of music lovers and practitioners, to revitalize its historic practices, to reawaken interest in the familiar and forgotten, to reconstruct musical ways that range from the radical to the reliable. The re-words we use to describe this vision of education are a rebuke to those methodological ends for which certainty is a quest, and for those traditions that trade in the authentic as authoritative. And I mean, like, amen, brother. Like, that's just, this was one of those, um, I, as everyone knows, and people ch chastise me for, I dog ear and write all over my books. I'm one of those people. Um, and this was one of those sections that I just had huge brackets around because I remember getting to this part of the book and thinking, that's exactly it, right? It's not the all or nothing. It's, I love this idea that, and especially you, you know, borrowing from Sandy's words that we can find just that opportunity to create the pilot study or just that one space to say, what if, so that, like you said, the closed, the closed system, this is the way I always looked at it. You think closed and a lot of people would automatically think of a door or a hinge or something. And the idea that something has become closed meant that it was open at some point. Right. And I think that's the possibility to hold on to is that right. it might be closed now, but it wasn't constructed in a void, right? Like it had to have been open. And so it can be opened again. And I just, I love the, the words you choose to describe it. I think it's so powerful. I, I think... When we make practice the point and not the person, um, we have situations like Joanna in the, I, I'm actually gonna, I get shaking when I talk about Joanna because I feel like I know her. And Joanna, I, if, if I, God, I wish I would, I could meet her someday because she is the, in the experience of writing a book, you don't know what the outcome will be, but certain characters um, play out in my classrooms and in conversations and I will tell you that every single professor that I've spoken with will say, well, you know, Joanna is the story about uh, the girl at a conservatory who was told she didn't, she, she was told she didn't have talent and she was counseled out of music. And um, every single professor I've spoken, I've spoken with more or less says, well, maybe that wasn't the right school for Joanna. And every student I've spoken with says, I am Joanna, hmm. and the Joannas happen because we aren't caring about the person more than the practice, and thus there's this there's this violence in our field that we refuse to talk about. Yeah, and it's hurting people. And the other thing I would say about Joannas, uh, Joanna, is everything from um, my students have found. Uh, it's such inspiration and sadness in her story that they have recreated in, in these operas, her story. Wow. Um, I, I have people arguing about her. Um, and uh, it's, it's our dirty secret in our field, I think, that we will dispose of people if they aren't worthy of us teaching them. Yes. And, I want to call that out yeah. and say um, we can be more humane um, as educators, even if we, okay, it's, it's all right to freely elect to study Baroque uh, trumpet. Uh, you, uh, it's, not a, it's not 
anti-democratic to be a specialist. A democracy needs specialists. What's wrong is when you want to learn Baroque trumpet uh, and your, your teacher sees you as the problem and doesn't see his job to help you with your quest. Yeah. Uh, and we then dispose of people who don't somehow meet the benchmarks or the uh, who can't make it over the wall because you know when we're talking about closed systems they're bounded and so if we if you can't make the benchmark to get into one of these systems um, you're disposed of or if you if you earn the right into the system and uh, you aren't earning your keep you get thrown out yeah so all of this is um, not moral and uh, in in so many ways um, acts of violence uh, that I, I want to keep talking about. This, I think this brings up such an important aspect of particularly teaching in public schools, but I would argue teaching anywhere, and that's the idea of inclusivity um, and the importance of that. And, you know, concepts of differentiation and all these, you know, we can use tons of buzzwords and target words and IEPs and 504s and all the great, you know, and I say legitimately, I'm not being sarcastic, like the great structures that we have in place to secure and to protect and to encourage concepts of inclusivity in our music classrooms. Um, I would argue though, without sounding overly pessimistic, that the realities are far from the ideal in that, especially in secondary instrumental music, we get this idea that, you know, well, that person is no longer in band or orchestra because they just, they couldn't cut it. Right. Like they didn't make the audition. That's why they're not in the varsity group and they're upset about it. So they quit and it becomes you have to earn the right to make music in high school. And I have I have always been vexed by that. I mean, across the country, you are hard pressed. It does exist, but you are hard pressed to find a beginning band or orchestra program at the high school level. You know, if you did not make that decision in sixth grade or fifth grade, if you did not you know, start that process, you're quote unquote, not good enough to be able to make music. And that's just the system. That's just the way that it is. And then of course it gets more complicated because the competitions and everything else are reinforcing that, right? I had in my first two years of teaching, I had a beginner orchestra at the high school I was teaching at. And it was a part to build the numbers and I wanted to invite people to do it. And um, I had an administrator say to me, don't you think, quote unquote, don't you think this is cruel? And I said, what do you mean cruel? And they said, you're setting these students up for failure. So how am I setting them up for failure? They said, there is no way that a student that starts learning to play the violin their sophomore year can compete at UIL. That was the box that we were living in. That was the box. And I thought, and immediately, and again, this is where my foot shaped, you know, mouth opened up. I said, but my goal is not that contest. My goal is to give these students an opportunity to make music on string instruments. That's what we're doing in my classroom. And there, I immediately recognized there was just this huge disconnect. And the places that we do see beginner instrumental ensembles, beginner choirs at the secondary level, there's an incredible culture in those programs that promotes this idea of just being able to be creative and expressive through music. A huge shout out to Francesca. It's good to see you friend um, who has a beginner orchestra at her high school. And I'm so glad, And it, but it frustrates me because, um, and I don't think Francesca would mind me sharing this because we've had conversations about this. A lot of the times that ends up being politicized. It turns into a ploy to get numbers because the more students you have, the better it is. It's what happened for me. I mean, we had it, it was quote unquote allowed for me to do this because we could build the numbers quicker, but then my schedule became maxed out and I was no longer able to teach that class because I had to teach these other courses and I was going between three campuses, so on and so forth. You know, the story of too many educators out there being stretched too thin and I had to drop, that was the very first thing. They said, well, you're not gonna do beginning orchestra anymore because you now have these students and you need to serve them and we need to be going towards this other model of success. And it just was heartbreaking to me. And it, it moved from what I considered a very political issue 
of do you have the students you need to be successful by our definition to then this idea of your especially you know your varsity ensemble these you know these flagship ensembles they are designed for your best students and if you can't make that cut and if you can't represent the school at this level um that that's an issue and these students quote unquote you know when we start uh, what, what i refer to as a verb which is not necessarily appropriate but othering students right we start to other these students well those students aren't supposed to be in that ensemble or those students shouldn't be and it it's devastating to me because i had students that either received special education services or you know we would have candid conversations there were kids that knew like yeah i mean this is as good as i can get right now with my personal and academic obligations i'm not going to practice you know three hours a day like this is where i am and i would constantly ask myself can i as the educator meet you where you are and still facilitate meaningful learning rather than pushing you through some sieve and then deciding well you're a scrap now you didn't make the cut you're not going to be you know in the sausage which is how i feel about it sometimes we're pressing and making this academic sausage this musical sausage of just mass producing things and reiterating things and we're like well you're just you're not good enough to be in and it's just devastating i mean devastating yeah it's challenging to me to see how especially i mean shifting gears a little bit how we find ways to be more inclusive um and knowing I had the incredible fortune of talking to uh, Dr. Rhoda Bernard, who's over the um, Berkeley Institute for Art Education and Special Needs. And I went to a conference she does called the ABLE Assembly. For everyone listening, if you've not seen it or heard about it, it's phenomenal and definitely worth going. Um, and I, I went there and was just humbled isn't the appropriate word. I mean, gobsmacked at what educators have been doing to invite more participation into their classroom and get more people involved and not having the, the limitations that we inherit of you have to be able to do this in order to participate. And if you can't do that, you can't participate and creating these barriers, you know, creating these barriers that will, well, I learned to teach this way. And therefore, if, if you can't learn the way I teach, then you can't participate. Instead of, okay, you learn in this unique way, I'm now gonna challenge myself to teach in a unique way. Do you, I mean, do you think that's something that, especially with, with your experience in education and, and teaching future teachers, do you think that that, what I would consider a paradigm is changing, that I learned a certain way to teach, and if students can't learn the way I teach, then they can't be my students. Because I think we experience that, you know, K through 16. I think that's all the way through. Do you think that's starting to shift at all? Um, here's here's some shifts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I found I found I found a, 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 a ray of hope. Um, one thing I'm noticing in the 18 years of teaching the same class. Of course, it changes over 18 years. But one thing, I, one thing I've noticed is even our Juilliard students are coming with secret hobbies like playing the accordion. They're, they're also um, thinking of a wonderful Juilliard um, a violin player who I discovered is very good at rapping. Uh, nice. So that is something new, and I, and I think that's a generational shift, and I think it's happening in spite of the training that it takes to get into Juilliard, because nobody can say, don't go on the inter internet, right? Don't. Yeah. don't. Um, so it's possible that our contemporary musicians, young musicians today, are in better shape than, we, than you are, your generation, and then my generation. Um, I was specifically told not to do anything except what it ne I needed to do to get into Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was obedient and did what I was told. Um, and it took a lot of time to unlearn uh, all of that. But anyway, getting back to your question, I do not think that notions of equity and inclusion are possible in a school like Juilliard 
or University of Washington because equity and, and inclusion means that we have different ends for different students based on their talents, what they are funded with, what culture they bring to the classroom, and what their life goals are, mm -hmm. and that we accommodate them according to what they're good at and what they're not good at. Yeah. And that everyone has, we design a different route for every student to get to their particular end. That is the goal of inclusion and social justice and um, equity. In particular, equity is the idea of um, making special accommodations for maximum success. Um, and not seeing learners from a deficit perspective. Yeah. But seeing them coming to the classroom fully funded, but funded differently than the person next to you. There is no way that we could bring that model to the practice of teaching concert piano as it is conceived of today. Because it would mean that you come with uh, you come with your idea of what you want to do with the piano. <laughs> you come with your idea of what you want to do with the piano. And I, as a teacher, will facilitate the different expectations that this diverse classroom has for their life project. I, I simply cannot imagine that happening because exactly what you were saying about the Texas system, the conservatory system also has to produce a very specific one-dimensional model um, and if you can't there, there is no accommodating you there is mm -hmm. only molding you to that model so now there are conservatories are doing things like talking about portfolio careers they're trying to help students create business models and uh, live um, in social media spaces yeah but they're changing they're not changing the end goal uh, they're just saying, well, we gave you this business class. We, we brought in this social media expert. The onus is on you. It's not on us. We, we will keep doing what we're doing because we don't have to change. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know, but, but every institution has somebody thinking differently hmm. and every institution, uh, has that person who is chipping away at the wall and doing their little pilot studies, whether they call it that or not. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not I'm hopeless, <laughs> not hopeless I'm, because I, I do see a different kind of student um, in my classroom today. Yeah. Uh, I see students who are able to, most of them were able to move from this, uh, space of social uh, composing and community making. And we, in the bumpiest way possible, we had to move it to Soundtrap and mm. to clunky online settings. Um, I don't think they could have, I, I think that's typical of this new generation. But now we have to leverage that. I mean, I think that's, you know, if, if we, hopefully maybe we can talk a little bit about what it means right now to teach, um, in a in the new COVID nineteen generation, yeah, they will have to have that facility. And and a school like Juilliard is or or University of Washington is in trouble if they can't help their students be successful in a world that is now wildly uh, 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 with wild surprises and um, all bets are off teaching and and music playing. Um, and you see people scrambling in interesting ways. Um, but I'll tell you, <laughs> I'm going to stop for it, take a pause, take a deep breath. I'll tell you, though, it's not virtual choirs. And, yeah. you know, those are the corniest things I've ever seen. And, and uh, I don't think it's in virtual bands. I think it's, um, it's, it's taking, um, for the moment, maybe putting aside what we can't do um, and thinking differently about what we can do because we're not going to be playing flutes and oboes with spit flying everywhere for a couple of years until there's a vaccine. Um, you know, woodwinds were spit machines. 
That's all we think about is our spit. Well, spit it is, is our friend. It's so crazy that you say that because it's okay. So, like full disclosure, I'm doing a virtual orchestra right now, right at my university. But here's what I find interesting is how how people are trying to leverage that to hold on to something that doesn't exist right now. Um, if if that makes sense, that I think what is powerful about what this global pandemic has done. And I, I try to be very cautious the way that I say this because I sincerely do not want to sully the dignity of veterans and servicemen and women in the military. Uh, but I was, I was talking to a friend that I said, you know, this is so sociopolitically and sort of psychologically, this is the World War II for this generation in that the entire globe has been unified by an experience. And there's, there's not really anything in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century that we could point out after World War II where every person on the planet had been affected by something. Um, so again, with all due respect to servicemen and women, it's not to draw that parallel to a time of war, but there is this social war that's going on, right? There are these social battles of, this is the way life was before, and I have you know, one of three options. I'm going to lean into it and embrace the change and move forward. I'm going to live in denial and shut down and nothing is going to change or happen. <laughs> or I'm going to fight against it and I'm desperately going to try to cling on to what I had before and assume that I can somehow get a resemblance of it or bring it back to the way that it was. And I've heard a lot of people saying, we need to take, you know, take account of it. It's not gonna be the same. It's never gonna be the same music ed, education in general, what we're looking at is never going to be the same. It's like, okay, great, but then what are we doing in that? And I made what I do really consider a difficult decision to try some sort of a virtual ensemble experience. Um, you know, I'm at a small liberal arts school. My, the orchestra that I conduct is mostly non-music majors. So it's, it's the whole premise of the ensemble is to engage people that would not have music otherwise. It's meant to be very welcoming. And I thought, I want the students to have an experience. And it was crazy in that I looked at the virtual ensemble as a way to reinforce educational systems and opportunities that I wanted my students to have. It was never meant to replace live performance and rehearsals. It can't. It cannot, exclamation point. It can't. What, I, what really frustrated me was I immediately recognized that to the novice, that's what I'm trying to do. To someone that's not thinking about education or musical experience or the cultural around orchestras, they look at it as, oh, good job, you still had a concert, you still produced something. They're just completely ignorant, not stupid, ignorant to what the process is and what it looks like. And this is someone, you know, no background in music. All they see is a performance in front of them. And I started talking to some friends, some of whom were chastising me, like, why are you buying into the trend? You know, don't do it. And I was like, well, here's the deal. The way I set it up, students are recording things, they're sending it to me, I'm giving them feedback. So I've, I've created an accountability measure so that I know the students are practicing, they're being challenged, they're learning new things, they're getting teacher feedback that's meaningful, they're sending in second recordings, and as I'm getting the recordings, we're gonna create a product that they can be proud of where it's not just an individual thing, I can still connect them to the whole. So for me, I looked at it really objectively. I wanted to say, I need a system that allows me to still be able to teach. And as I started seeing these virtual ensembles, that's how I looked at it. I was like, yeah, this is great. And then slowly, as conversations matured, as transparency took place, I started to hear and see there are all these sincerely great platforms through social media that educators from all over the world have, you know, tied into to be able to feed off of each other. I bring that up because the conversations became very pointed became very angry of, you know, this is just for show and there's no real learning taking place and you're just doing it to satisfy an administrator. And then shockingly, people would reinforce that to say, yeah, I only did this because my principal told me to do it. I don't want them to forget about me. And then there was a small but strong voice of people saying, well, no, this is not a ploy for me. This was a way for me to engage my students. It will never replace what I had, but it is a way of doing something rather than nothing. And again, I, I retreat back to these three people that are trying to navigate this time where 
they're going to lean into the changes and embrace what resources we have. They're going to shut down or they're going to fight against it. And I see that maturing in the professional dialogues. And I literally just typed, this was last week, to a comment thread that was happening. I said, you know, can we, can we embrace the fact that everyone is dealing with this differently? Can we allow a space for people to mourn? Can we allow a space for people to be creative and to produce things? And we like it or don't like it, and we can consume it or not consume it. And we embrace the fact that some people are in denial. I, I don't know that they will get what they want. I don't think things will ever be the same, but they have the right to feel that way. You were you were gesturing. I wanted to let you in. Sorry, I I got on that soapbox and rode it hard. So, no, I think what has to happen is the teacher uses their best pedagogical toolkit, and yours is such that you are you are making something authentic and sincere happen using this platform yeah trying for sure <laughs> so, yeah, yeah exactly exactly and so uh as i i am pretty well for sure i know i'm teaching my creativity class this summer online uh i would say it's better than 50 50 chance will be online in the fall uh how do i um make a space for my students to contribute what they do without looking at it from a deficit perspective. Hmm. You say each person comes to this class endowed differently with facility on an instrument, facility on a voice, facility with technology, yeah. uh, interest in this, interest in that. And technology is only the medium by which we explore certain things. Hmm. So that's the way I'm threading my needle because yeah. um, I, I also think that if you are going to move, like for example, the spring, um, the expectations for person to person, small group composing work to the sudden shift to online, well, that was, a, that was emergency disrupt, disruptive teaching. Yeah. If it's still that way next spring, then, then, then there's a prerequisite that we know that you are comfortable in this space or we, we work around this. So I think the worst thing that's happening right now is that our identities as teachers are often, are, are often we say, oh, I'm really flexible and I'm good at change. And then we are confronted with a situation and we're like, wow, yeah. I suck. Uh, <laughs> and so I spent most of this semester uh, dealing with the idea that I'm a bad teacher and that I am not um, a value add. <laughs> the only value add that's going on is uh, the, the, the students that are comfortable with technology are coming forward. Hmm. Uh, Maybe, maybe the other students are learning from them or, or not. It was the last seven weeks. It was, it was just a, um, it was not an, it was not a space, um, a, an affirming space to be a teacher in. Yeah. And, and, uh, but if I agree to keep teaching and these are the conditions, it is now my responsibility to be strategic as I design the next class. Hmm. So I have to now, I have to now, because this is what good teaching is anyway. You know, I can't really do this, but I, I can do this. I, I, I can do this and I can't. So yes, that is, um, and, and then that's when teaching becomes fun. When you yeah. play both with your limitations and um, what you think you're good at. The, the only thing that's terrible is when you're, playing with your limitations and suddenly you have nothing left that you're good at. <laughs> so, well, anyway. for whatever it's worth, I would argue that that reflexive quality of, of being a great educator is the ultimate strength. In my opinion, the, the ability to recognize where the deficits are 
Um, the greatest danger I think any educator and any student for that matter can have is, is assuming that you have everything under control of making the assumption that I know it all. I know how to do it. I've been teaching for X number of years. I've whatever. The minute that we stop allowing ourselves to say, this is where I'm still struggling. This is what I still need to know. Here's this new situation of, I mean, I was, it's, it's interesting to me because I'm, um, without sounding ageist or inviting that into the conversation, I am a relatively young faculty member at my institution. I mean, just statistically speaking, right? Not buying into any of the socio-political issues that come with that, but just like statistically speaking, I'm relatively young. There were some assumptions that I was, or let me say some bubbles I was happy to burst of people that immediately turned to me and thought, hey, you're younger than me, so you know about technology. I say, friend, that is not the case. It doesn't work that way. And it's been interesting to see how that's played out with students that we make an assumption because we're in quote unquote an age of technology or that like we have technology as a part of our lives that, you know, I don't even, I mean, there was a handful of my students that had ever even used Zoom. And, but there were huge assumptions that they'll just jump onto this platform and know how to navigate it and be totally comfortable with it. And then immediately was, there was a surge of, you know, Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Panopto and like, I mean, just, all of these softwares that were magically at the forefront of our teaching and how we teach and we're having to navigate it with our students and i i dare to say this out loud because it is quite presumptuous of me but i think there is a great opportunity for for everyone for students and teachers and administrators to be humbled by this experience to truly as you already pointed out which i would strongly refute your claim that you're a bad teacher I think you're an excellent educator in that you recognize what you don't know. And that, that unity that we get out of that, of every being, everyone being able to say, none of us were prepared for this, none of us understood it, and now I am having to depend on my students to lead a lesson. I am having to depend on these educators that think divergently to now lead the team because they've been thinking this way already or they have these resources that we didn't know about and I am no longer the one with all the answers. I'm reaching out to people in new ways that I would not have had to do otherwise. I think that can be, and it will take years for us to fully appreciate it, I think. I think that can be a beautiful product of this experience that everyone is undertaking. I'm reading a comment from Dr. Browning. It's good to see you here. Um, he said that his his students experienced a totally new level of independence. Uh, oh my God, and it's so true. Not having the face-to-face -face contact. I talked to a student yesterday about this. Not seeing them in the hallway, I didn't realize how, how damning that was for that student-teacher relationship. You know, for the class to be over, but for you to be able to hang out a little bit and talk or just read the body language or have a better understanding of where people are. The, the informal assessments we do all the time, I'm so frustrated that Zoom doesn't allow me to, to do those check-ins, you know, that I, I can't, you know, turn from the whiteboard or from the presentation to say, you know, what do you think about that? Does that make sense? And I can read, you know, sort of the furled brow or that cocked head to say, okay, I need to reteach or whatever. We're, we're losing some of those techniques. But as we lose those, there are new techniques to sort of cherish and say, well, this is what that would look like. And as long as we're still pushing towards a goal of education, of transformation, of change through this adjugative process, I, I, again, I hesitate to say, I don't think we can go wrong. If we still have student learning at the forefront of it, it'll look different and we might not be the one facilitating it, but that, that has to always be the ultimate goal of an educator. This is, I can't believe it's already been an hour. Um, it's really, it just blows my mind how quickly this time goes. Uh, I want to respect your time, and I'm so grateful for everybody that was watching. A, a definite shout out to Steve McMillan. Thank you, sir, um, for your comments. An incredible violinist in, uh, in Texas that I had the privilege of working with. And a special shout out to my students, to Chris and uh, Valerie for chiming in, some of my high school students that I was teaching. It's so good to read your comments and uh, to all of my colleagues from Texas that tuned in and others. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Um, you know, responding with emojis. I see all of those and liking the comments. 
and just being interactive in this process. I'm so grateful that I can facilitate this. Uh, this is a weekly project, and so next week I'll be speaking with another educator, another colleague or friend. If you have any ideas or suggestions, please feel free to reach out to me and let me know through Facebook or through email. And I look forward to facilitating more of these talks and talking about the things that we're all thinking about and finding new opportunities to teach and to learn in this environment that we're operating in. I'm so grateful for all of your support. And please, please continue to, to listen and to talk with each other. And don't let this end in the, in the hour or so that we spend every Sunday talking to each other. I really hope that it fuels new conversations. Send people to the YouTube links. Uh, they definitely do not need to come to me, reach out and, and read some of these books that we've referenced, plugged into these authors, or talk to some other people. Maybe something just sparked a curiosity in your own mind that you can start your own conversation. It definitely does not have to come from me. Start your own conversations and continue to talk and create this dialogue. It's the only way that we're gonna see real transformation. So a huge thank you again to Dr. Alsop. It's just an honor to be able to speak with you. I hope that it is definitely not the last time. Um, I want to connect with you again, whether it's through teacher talks or informally and just continue to talk about these things. I'm inspired by the work that you're doing and I know that your students are so grateful for everything you're accomplishing. Um, thank you again and again. Uh, to everybody else, I look forward to seeing you next week. Please feel free to send suggestions to me, uh, questions or comments or people that you think would be a great person to talk to. Have a fantastic week. Stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy. I look forward to seeing you guys in the coming weeks.